Numbers chapter 32, and we're going to read five verses. So when you have it, say amen. 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 If you don't have it, say wait a minute. Okay, I'll wait for you. Okay, time's up. Numbers 32, verse 1 through 5. It says, the Reubenites and Gadites, who had very large herds and flocks, saw that the lands of Jazer and Gilead were suitable for livestock. Suitable for what? So they came to Moses and Eleazar, the priest, and to the leaders of the, of the community and said, Atharoth, Debon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Alila, Sebon, Nebo, and Beon. Uh-huh. The land the Lord should do before the people of Israel are suitable for livestock. Suitable for what? And your servants have livestock. Your servants have what? Okay. If we have found favor in your eyes, they said, let this land be given to your servants as our possession. Do not make us cross the Jordan. You can go ahead and give your neighbor a wave, a thumbs up, and you can be seated or give them a smile. It's so good to see all of you looking smart in the house of the Lord. And I also want to encourage those of you that sing or you play an instrument. As you can see, Tracy Carter is going to be joining us next Friday for our worship practice. If you sing, you want to be a part of the choir or the worship team, we invite you to come on out. How many could already see a mass choir up here? Can you see it? Amen. Praise the Lord. So I want to encourage you to come on this Friday right here at 7 o'clock. This morning, I would like to speak a message that I believe the Lord has placed upon my heart. And the title of the message is Comfortable Outside of Canaan. Comfortable Outside of Canaan. So what's happening in this passage of scripture is that the people of God were promised a certain part of land. And the name of that land was called Canaan. But on their way to Canaan... They ran into some good land, okay? So what happened is when they ran into the good land, they wanted to stay there. Instead of going into the land the Lord had promised them. So it's like this is Egypt, okay? Say this is Egypt, and we're in Egypt. But then we get delivered from Egypt to go into Canaan. So Canaan's on that side, right? So on our way to Canaan out of Egypt, we run into a good land, and the land is green, and it's good for livestock. So we want to meet with Moses, our leader, and say, hey, Moses, you know what? Instead of going over into Canaan, where the Lord has promised us, we want to know if we could just stay right here because this is good land for livestock, and we have livestock. So don't make us cross the Jordan. So that's the conversation that we just read. So what happened is they, they came out of Egypt, they had conquered some Moabites and Midianites, and now they're on their way to the promised land. But on their way to the promised land, <clears throat> they run into a good land. Seeing that the land was good, they wanted to talk to Moses about, hey, Moses, can we just stay right here? So what happened is the Reubenites and the Gadites pulled their leader Moses aside and they'll tell him, we got something to share with you, okay? We know the Lord has promised us Canaan, but we see this land is very green, and it will be good for our animals. So we want to know if we could just stay right here instead of crossing the Jordan and going into the land the Lord has promised us. So they met with Moses. They shared their heart with Moses. So the Lord had promised them Canaan, but they wanted to stay in the good land. Somebody say good land. See, it's important to know that they were no longer in Egypt. They weren't in Egypt no more, and they were on their way to the promised land. So that is where the conversation that we read in Numbers 32, verses 1 through 5, that's the conversation that we just read. They said, Moses, we want you to know, we want to know if it's okay if we could just stay here in this land because it's green and we have a lot of livestock. So being that we have cattle, we want us to know if we could stay here instead of going into the land the Lord has promised us. Please don't make us cross the Jordan. What the Jordan was was the Jordan River. So they had to cross the Jordan River to get to the promised land. So Moses told them, shall your countrymen go to war while you sit here? 
Huh? In their minds, they probably thought Moses would understand, after all, we're not in Egypt no more. And we're better off than we were before. So Moses will understand. But how many thank God for leaders that don't let you settle? How many thank God for leaders that challenge you to get better? Amen. Amen. So let's bring it to you and I. Sometimes you and I can get comfortable on our way to the promise that God has given us. Because we got, we got to remember, they were in Egypt, but the Lord had promised them Canaan. And they were on their way. They were happy. Then they got some livestock, and they said, hey, wait a minute. This land right here is really good for livestock, so we need to talk to Moses if we can stay here. And sometimes you and I, we could be on our way to the promise, to the vision that God has given us, and then we run into a good land. Huh? After all, we're no longer in Egypt. Um, after all, we're not in the party life no more. After all, we're not doing drugs anymore. After all, we're not drinking anymore. Yes, that's true, but at the same time, are we in the place that God has promised us? Sometimes we can get comfortable with our progress on our way to the promise. Oh, that's pretty good. That'll wrap right there. Sometimes we can get comfortable in the progress on our way to the promise, on our way to accomplishing the original idea of what we had in mind when we first started. Come on, somebody. We can settle for good instead of going for great. What we need today are Christians who are going to go after all that God has for us. God has not called us to be average, ordinary, or status quo. Let me say it again. God has not called us to be average, ordinary, or status quo. Uh -huh. We need to have a vision for our lives. Let's not be like the tribes who got comfortable but let's be willing to go after all that God has for you and I. I like, to look, I like to look at it like this. Have you ever seen a poster of someone playing sports, maybe cricket, rugby, soccer, basketball, whatever it may be? And in basketball, we used to have posters where they're like dunking. Got Michael Jordan. He's dunking on someone. Or maybe it's soccer and they're kicking the goal, whatever it may be. But back in the day, they used to have posters. Now they have NFTs and everything's digital, right? But back in the day, you would buy a poster. And on that poster, you got a few group of people. You have the ones scoring the goal or the try or the basket. And then you have the ones that are being scored on. And then you have the ones in the background that are like blurry. You can't even see them. Right? They're, they're blurry, right? So you have the one that's maybe if it's dunking a basketball or Kicking a goal, they're like this, right? They're just like in the zone. And then you got the guy that's being dunked on, right? And then you got the ones in the background. But they're so blurry, you can't even see them, right? You're like, blurry. I, <laughs> I guess my question is, which one do we want to be? Do we want to be the one putting in work and going for all that God has for us? Or do you want to be the one getting dunked on? Or do you want to be the one in the background? All blurry. Can't see you. But you got the jersey on. Which one do we want to be? God didn't save you and I so we could just fill up a church seat. But he saved us because he has a purpose and a plan for our lives. Come on and clap for the Lord. I, I, I said, come on and clap for the Lord. See, it was easier for these tribes to stay right where they were at instead of believing God to take them into the promised land. Instead of believing God to take them across the Jordan. After all, they're not in Egypt no more. After all, they're not doing the things they used to do no more. 
And maybe they were thinking, it was a lot of work just to get out of Egypt, and now you want me to go into the promised land, and we got to cross the Red Sea? I mean, the Jordan, I'm good. I spent all my energy just trying to get out of Egypt. I spent all my energy just getting to this good land. People talking about you, people stabbing you in the back, people doing this, I had to feed the livestock, I had to carry all my goods, I had to do this and I had to do that. Man, I spent all my energy just getting to this good land. But God has the promised land. I said God has the promised land. Mm. But they could have said, I spent all my energy just getting here. Let me just get comfortable right outside of Canaan. I know Canaan is right there. And matter of fact, it is even promised to me. But I ran into something good, and I just want to be comfortable outside of Canaan. But I believe we have some world shakers in the house this morning. See, what happened is they had lost their vision of getting into the promised land because they left Egypt to go into the promised land. But on their way to the promise, they lost their vision in the process. Anybody ever gone through a process? Oh, come on now. Anybody ever got discouraged in the process? Oh, uh, y'all don't hear me this morning. Let me say it again. Anybody ever get discouraged in the process? When you first started out, you were like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm excited. And then you start going through the process. Mm, I'm going to get in this ministry. Oh, I'm on fire for the Lord. I'm going to start this business. I'm going to do that for God. And then you start going through the process. Uh -huh. And then the process kind of stowed our vision. We started off excited on our way to Canaan. Ooh, I'm excited. Then someone stabs you in the back. Ooh, ah, that hurt. Ah, but I'm still going. I'm still going. I'm still going. Hallelujah. 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 Right? Still moving forward. Then you keep going. Boom. Then another trial hits. Bam. But you're still going. You're going through the process, right? And then you got... So many opposition coming and so many things coming, you're like, you know what? Maybe I should just hold off on going for the original idea and just settle for this. Oh, it's quiet up in here. Huh? When we started off, it's like, yeah, I'm going to go get my matric. I'm going to go back. Oh, I, I stepped on someone's toe. her. Ouch. You started off, I'm going to go get my matric, right? So you're excited, got your school clothes. Bought some new, new clothes, right? Ready to go. And you're faithful for a week. But then you get homework. <laughs> Taste better. Come on, somebody. <laughs> All of a sudden, the process is not as exciting no more. Because now it's a thousand-page essay. Come on, somebody. No, I'm just kidding. Thousand-word essay. And you're like, whoa, man, the promised land looked it good. But I didn't know it was that much work. Come on, somebody. That's what happened to the Reubenites and Gadites. They were on their way to the promised land, but the process kind of stole the vision. See, some of us even had vision before the pandemic. Some of us, the pandemic just snatched your vision from you. You're excited, right? Pandemic hit. Oh, wow. Praise the Lord. I'm comfortable. And we've been comfortable. Now the pandemic is kind of like two, over two years old, but we're still in the good land. Thank you for the clap. I appreciate that. Thank you. But I want to know if there's anybody that wants to go into the promised land. I said, is there anybody that wants to go into the promised land? You started off, you said, I'm going to go get my learners. You're excited. Then you're like, $500 or 500 rand a lesson? You? Me brew. That's a lot of money. So you're like, ah. Uh, tackies are learning lessons. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the process got the process got too expensive. Started off excited. Started off ready to get that learners or ready to get your license even. Or how about this one? Ready to go back and up your matric grades. You know that's possible. And you started off good, but the process 
can steal our vision. But I come to encourage someone this morning. I come to challenge someone this morning. I come to stir someone up this morning to get that vision back. You might be going through the process. You might feel a little discouraged right now. I think we've all been discouraged at one time or another, if we're honest. But I come to encourage somebody to say, keep on going. God didn't bring you this far to drop you off. God didn't bring you this far so you can get comfortable. God didn't bring you out of Egypt. God didn't bring you out the pillar post just to get comfortable. God didn't bring you out of 151 just to get comfortable. God didn't bring you out just to get stuck. But we serve a miracle working God. And I come to encourage you, even in the midst of the process, even in the midst of the difficult times, even in the midst of people talking about you, keep on going forward for Jesus because God has a plan for your life. Come on and clap for the Lord this morning. No, no, I said clap for the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. And here's the heavy thing. It wasn't even opposition that wanted them to stop from going into the promised land. It was the things they acquired on their way to the promised land. It wasn't that they didn't have the ability to get there. It wasn't that God had not promised them the promised land, but it was that they got comfortable on the way. They lost their vision of moving forward. When they first left Egypt... They had a vision to go into the land of Canaan, but on their way, they lost the vision of going into Canaan because they got comfortable. Now, I know sometimes you and I think the enemy of great is bad, but sometimes the enemy of great is good. Tell your neighbor, don't settle. Come on, tell them like you mean it, don't settle. Now, give them an attitude and say, don't settle. I like that one. I felt that one up here. Yeah. When you and I have a vision, it will not allow us to settle and become complacent. But it drives us to keep moving forward. And let's take a look at Paul's life and then I'll be done. In Acts 22 or Acts 26, 12, it says this. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, I was, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness. Of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. For those of you that don't know, Paul, before he got saved, his name was Saul. And here's what he used to like to do before he got saved. Saul liked to go from city to city or province to province, township to township, and try to get people to blaspheme. That was his main goal. Man, who can I get to backslide today? Who can I persecute today? What Christians can I persecute today? That's what Saul used to like to do. So what happened is he was on one of those journeys. He was going to Damascus to try to go get some Christians to blaspheme. But as he was on his way, he had an encounter with God. And that's what we just read right now. And it says about noon, and he's testifying before the king because he's given his testimony. And he says, King, I was on the road and I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground. Then I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? So that's why it says Saul because Paul's name before he got saved was Saul. Okay? But then as Paul is testifying, he says, King, I want to let you know, I had that encounter with Jesus and my life has been changed. He says, so then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. And he says, to those in Damascus and Jerusalem and Judea, he says, I began to preach the gospel. So the same Saul that used to persecute Christians, try to get them to blaspheme as he was on his way to go take care of the business he used to do, he had an encounter with God, and now he's on fire for the Lord. So what happened is he took that same energy that he had for the things of the world and he turned it around for God and his name changed to Paul. I feel like preaching. Can I preach just a little bit? Uh, I feel the power of God. Can I preach just a little bit? 
So what happened is, Paul says, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. I think we need to understand something. The vision that God has for our lives is not going to be taught. It needs to be caught. I'm going to say it again. The vision that God has for you and I is not going to be taught to us. It's got to be caught. What you and I accomplish for God is not by chance. I mean, yeah, it's not by chance. It's by choice. Our purpose is not just going to happen by accident. Our purpose is not going to happen by chance. It's a choice that you and I make to go after all that God has for us. Are you with me this morning? It is very important for you and I to have a vision for our lives. God told Abraham in Genesis 13, 14, as far as you can see of the land I will give to you and your descendants. As far as your vision takes you, that's what I will give you. Let me read to you a quote from Helen Keller, who was blind, and this is what she said. The only thing worse than being born blind is having sight with no vision. Somebody say vision. I, I feel some world shakers stirring up in here this morning. I feel some history makers stirring up here this morning. I feel, I feel it in the atmosphere. I feel somebody's going to get your vision back. Somebody's going to get your purpose back. Somebody's going to go after all. You got a little discouraged in the process. Here. You got a little bummed out in the process. But I come to stir us up this morning to keep on going after all that God has for you. Go, I said I come to stir you up this morning to go after all that God has for you. Be that teacher. Be that doctor. Be that lawyer. I don't know what you feel God's called you to do. Be that pro athlete. Be that business owner. Be that missionary. Be that pastor. Be that world shaker. Be that history maker. Be that mountain mover. Be that trailblazer. I don't know who I'm talking There might just be one of you here. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I come to encourage you this morning. You might be a little discouraged in the process, but I want to encourage you to go after all that God has for you. Come on in. Rio de Janeiro, a praise. Three things, three things that vision will do for us. Number one, having a vision gives meaning to our lives. Paul had a vision. We're going to talk about Paul a little bit, then we'll wrap it up. Paul had a vision, and when he got a vision, it gave meaning to his life. See, when you and I have a goal and a vision for our lives, it gives our lives meaning. We're no, we're not, we, we know we're not here just by accident or a mistake. Oops. No, God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. We were placed here for a reason, and our goal should be to see that vision that God has for our lives come to pass. See, vision gives our lives meaning because it gives you and I something to shoot for. It gives us a goal for our life. I often say living our life without vision is like playing football or soccer without a goal. Many of us watched the game last night. And you've seen them scoring goals. But how long would you like watch the game if there was no goal? You kick it to me, I kick it back to you. You kick it to me, I kick it back to you. <laughs> right? Back and forth. But some of us got even excited last night. Right? Yeah. On your status. Woo. Not going to name no names, praise the Lord. No I'm not going to name no teams, hallelujah. Just keep it neutral. But we were excited, right? Some of us were excited. But how long would we watch a soccer game if there was no goal? But you know what's heavy? Is sometimes we live life with no goal. And then we wonder why it's not exciting. The only thing that makes soccer, cricket, Rugby exciting is because the people on the field are trying to reach a goal. And whether it's a try, right, whether it's a goal in the goal, that's what makes it exciting. You know, that's what makes life exciting is when we get the goal that God has for our life. When we get the vision that God has for our life and we start trying to pursue that vision with all we got, to, it makes life exciting. Let me give you another. How many ever been bowling? If you've been bowling, just wave at me. Maybe at Grand West. Come on, somebody. Right? You've been bowling? Right. So you were bowling. Well, can I ask you a question? 
How long would you bowl if there was no pins? All right, good job. Didn't hit nothing. But it was a cool style. Right? You looked cool. Right? What makes bowling fun is you're trying to reach a goal. Man, this is good stuff right here. If there was no goal, you and I probably wouldn't go bowling for too long. We would just compliment each other on your style. Oh, that was a cool style. Oh, you look so cool. And if we're not careful, if we don't have a vision, then we start complimenting our style. Oh, your clothes look nice. Oh, this is good. Oh, the outward looks good. But how are we going toward the vision? How are we going after all God has for us? See, what makes living for God exciting is when we go for what God has for our lives. Having a vision makes living for God exciting. You ever seen a boring Christian? You, ever, you, you don't have to look at them. Just look straight. Keep looking straight. <laughs> just keep looking straight. You ever seen a boring Christian? Five years still doing the same thing. Ten years ago, they're still doing the same thing. 20 years, they're still doing the same thing. One day, I'm going to step out for God. One day. Been saying it for a long time. But, but you ever seen someone who's excited and on fire for the Lord, and they're going to new levels? It's because they have a vision. But what happens if you get boring Christians because they have no vision? It's like they're bowling with no pins. They've been at the same level for year after year, stuck in the good land. But I stopped by to encourage somebody this morning. It's time to go for all that God has for you. It's time to step out for the Lord. Come on, somebody, and give the Lord a good praise. So vision gives our lives meaning. Okay? It gives you and I a reason to do what we do. Just like Jesus, when he was here on earth in the flesh, his, he came to seek and to save that which was lost while he was here in the flesh. Well, now we're his body, and we have the same mission, and that's to seek and to save that which is lost. See, I guess the question is, what is your part in the body to help us reach the lost? Number two, not only does vision give us meaning, it gives us direction. This is good stuff right here. Vision gives us direction. If I tell you, okay, I want to go to Canal Walk. I believe it's that way, right? I tell you, okay, you guys, I got a vision. I'm going to go to Canal Walk, but you see me go this way. But your vision is that way. What vision does, it gives you direction. Have you ever met someone doing all kinds of work but not ever getting anything done? It seems like they're living their life on a treadmill, all kinds of movement, but no progress. They do whatever comes up to occupy their time. It's like they're on a treadmill. <laughs> Currently running. Consistently running. Consistently moving. You come back a year later, it's still in the same place. Come on, somebody. Come back five years later, sweating. Come on, somebody. But still in the same place. It's like they're running on a treadmill. A lot of action, but no movement. Why? Because vision gives us direction. Somebody say direction. See, what happened is having a vision and a goal for our lives gives us direction. It sets boundaries of what you and I should and shouldn't do and where we should and shouldn't go. Mm. Those boundaries help you and I to stay in line toward our vision. It restrains us. If you want to go to your vision today, then what happens is we need boundaries. If you want to get to your vision, you got to stay within the boundaries. Because what happens is vision puts boundaries on our life. Just stick with me. I'm, I'm going somewhere. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. So what does that mean? When I have no vision, I have no restraints. I just do whatever. Where there is no vision, I just go wherever I want to do, do whatever I want to do, because I have no purpose. Exactly when you play sports, if we get outside the boundary, we should call it short for out of bounds, you're out of the boundary, the referee will blow the whistle. You're out of bounds. Because people don't want to watch you just go in circles. So the referee has to be there to make sure the game keeps moving in the direction it was meant to be. That's how vision should be for our lives. When you and I get out of the boundary, vision blows the whistle and say, hey, 
Get back in the direction of your vision. Vision acts like a referee. It says, hey, wait, you're, you're getting out of bounds. Go back and get where you want to go because your vision gives you direction. Hey, hey, Susie Q ain't going that way. Chilly Willie ain't going that way. Oh, it's quiet up in here. Uh-huh. We, we start having vision that puts boundaries on our lives. Now, check this out. That's how our life should be. It should have boundaries that keep us in the direction of our goal, and when we get off track, vision blows the whistle. Once you and I set a vision or a goal, it puts boundaries on our life. If I want to be go get my matric, now I need to study. I got a boundary. If I want to go upgrade my marks on my matric, now I just set boundaries on my life. I need to study. If I want to go get my learners, I want to go get my license, I just set boundaries. Because now I got a vision, it's giving me boundaries. Are you with me? It's telling me what I need to do to get where I want to go. When we have a vision for our lives, it gives us boundaries. Now, instead of staying out late at night, I got to go study. Somebody say boundary. Instead of watching Netflix whole day, now I got to study. Oh, it's getting quieter and quieter. Instead of just scrolling all day on my phone for hours, now I need to go study. But when we have no vision, well, whatever, I don't know. What, I, what are you going to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? I don't know. What are you going to do? It's like bowling with no pins. Vision will give our life meaning and will give our life direction. I think you get my point. Vision acts like a spiritual navigation system. It tells you and I the steps we need to take to get to where we want to go. When you want directions, you could ask Siri. Come on, somebody. Right? You say, I want to go here. I'm not going to say your name because I might activate some of your phones. <laughs> Imagine if I said it right now and all your phones answered. That would be cool. But, but anyways, so you could ask Siri for directions. And she's going to give you the directions that you need to take for the vision that you put in. But how many know the navigation system doesn't work unless you know where you want to go? I'm going to say it again. The navigation system doesn't work unless we know where we want to go. And vision acts like a spiritual navigation system. Holy Ghost, take me to Canaan. Well, if you want to get to Canaan, this is what you need to do. You got to just press on through the process. Keep on pushing through discouragement. Make a left at stabbed in the back. <laughs> Make a right and gossip. <laughs> Keep on going forward when you have a setback. <laughs> and then when you get to there, you're going to make a right. Come on, somebody. And then you're going to make a left. And you're going to see a blue house? Don't stop there. Keep going. Come on. Somebody. And then you're going to see another house? Don't stop there. Keep going. If you do what I'm telling you to do, you will make your way to Canaan. Vision will act like a navigation. Yes, you've been having setbacks. Yes, you've been let down. Yes, you've been talked about. Yes, you might not have it all together. But I want to know if there's anybody in the house that wants to make their way to Canaan land. You want to go after all that God has for you? I want you to give him a praise. Come on, give him a radical praise. I want you to give him five seconds of a praise like you don't care what people think. You don't care what people say. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel the power. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody say vision. Have a seat. I'm almost done. Give me seven minutes. Some of you are going to time me right now. I'll be done. The last thing that vision does, it gives us passion. So not only does vision give us meaning, not only does it give us direction, it gives us passion. Paul got a vision from the Lord. He says, I would not disobedient to that vision. And I preached. Paul had a passion. The thing I like about Paul is once he found out God's purpose for his life, he pursued that purpose with a passion. Can somebody say passion? That's what I like about Paul. The same passion and energy that he put into the things he did before he got saved, he put that same energy into the things of God. 
Like I told you, before Paul got saved, he used to go from city to city. He used to go from province to province, place to place, and try to get Christians to blaspheme. But then he had an encounter with God. He was on his way to go do what he normally do. He was on his way to 151. <laughs> and then he got a flyer. Come on. He was on his way to pick and pay. Then he heard the worship. Come on, somebody. And then he walked into the house of God. And then he heard the preaching. And he had an encounter with the Lord. He was on his way to the fellow post. Come on, somebody. But then he ran into a street rally. Hey! And at the street rally, he gave his life to the Lord. I don't know who I'm talking to today. He was on his way to university to go study. But all of a sudden, some radical young people came and gave him a flyer and say, God can change your life. And then when he had an encounter with the Lord... He says, the same energy that I use for the things of the world, I'm going to turn it around and use it for God. Just like I was radical in the world, I'm radical for Jesus. I want to know, is there anybody in the house this morning that is radical? I know you used to be radical in the world. I know you used to do a lot of things in the world. But I want to know, are you still radical for Jesus? Are you sold out for Jesus? Are you willing to get radical and stand on a street corner and blast for Jesus? Are you willing? to wear your Christian t-shirt in your university? Are you willing to get loud for God? Hey! I know a lot of us are radical. We give a lot of money to a lot of different places. Are we willing to pay our tithes? Give an offering. He didn't just use his energy for worldly things and then get saved and kick back. Whoo, I'm so glad I'm saved. I could just chill in the house now. Praise the Lord. I remember when I was younger, I used to do a lot of different things. But now I'm just chilling for the Lord. You know, I'm a little up in age now, bless God. I'm about 22. <laughs> I'm, a little, I'm getting a little older now. I remember when I was younger, I used to be able to do that stuff. No, 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 no. Yeah? The same energy. I'm almost done. The same energy that he used to put into the things before he got saved, he turned it around and used that same zeal for God. Vision will give us passion. Now, when he had an encounter with God, he turned that same zeal around for the things of God. Paul was committed to the heavenly vision. Here's a few things that he went through. Check out, we think we go through trials, right? Look what Paul went through, but he kept preaching. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, it says, Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. That means he was whipped. And they gave him 39 of these. Five times. Yeah. Three times I was beaten with rods, he says. Once I was stoned, now not that kind of stone. There, back in the day, they had rocks where they would stone. I see some of you. They had rocks where they would stone you. All right. <laughs> Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Imagine going through all these things and still keeping the fire, still keeping the passion of the vision that God had placed upon his heart. Is there anybody in the house this morning that has a godly vision? I didn't come to preach to everybody. I just came to preach to the one that may have had that vision, but you got a little comfortable outside of Canaan. I come to encourage you to go after all that God has for you. Be that music producer. Be that pro athlete. Write that skit. Write that movie. Produce that CD. Start that business. Go for your matric. Go to university. Go to college. Is there anybody here catching what I'm saying? You can do it. You can go for it. 
Can I encourage? Like I said, I didn't come to preach to everybody. I came for the one that's gotten a little bit of comfortable. You started off excited. You started off, man, I'm going to go for all that God has for me. But somewhere in the process, you've lost your vision. I've come back to encourage you. I've come here to encourage you. Get that vision back. Get that fire back. Don't camp outside of Canaan. God has promised you, Canaan, go for all that God has for you. All right, maybe you didn't get it right the first time. Maybe you didn't get it right the second time. Go back and try it again. You took your learner's test and you failed. Go back again. You failed the second time. Go back again. You failed the third time. Go back again. You failed the fourth time. Go back again. Okay, you took your driver's lessons and you failed the first time. Go back again. You took your driver's lessons and you failed the second time. Go back again. You took your driver's lessons and you failed the third time. Go back again. You took your driver's lessons and you failed the fourth time. Go back again. Don't get comfortable. Don't get discouraged. Go for all God has for you. You went to go get your matric and you failed. Go back again. You went to go get your matric. I feel like preaching up in here. You went to get your matric and you failed. Go back again. You went to go get your matric and you failed. Go back again. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I stopped by to encourage you. Go for all that God. You tried out for that soccer club. They didn't accept you. Get better. Step up your game. Kick, kick a little better. Dribble a little better and go back again. You tried out for the soccer club, they neglected you again. Get better. Go to another level and go back again. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I stopped by to encourage you to go for all that God has for you. Come on and give them a good praise. Come on and give them a good praise. I want you to stand to your feet. I'm done. I want you to stand to your feet and clap like you're on your way to Canaan land. I want you to clap like you're on your way. Yes, you've gotten discouraged. Yes, we've gone through some trials. Yes, people talked about you. Yes, people laughed at you. Yes, people told you you didn't have it. You might have even told yourself, keep that rap, keep it with me. Come on with me, come on with me, come on. There we go. Yes, you might have even told yourself, I don't have what it takes. But I'm here to let you know, my Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. My Bible says, it gets told Alice and start, dear Christus, but make the here. My Bible says, I am more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Come on and praise him. Hey! Hey! Hallelujah! I feel something breaking. I feel something breaking in the atmosphere. I feel somebody's going to get that matric. Somebody's going to get that degree. Somebody's going to get that job. Hey, you apply for the job, they told you, no, go back again. You went back again, they told you, no, get better and go back again. Don't come back at the same level. What's different? You're going to still get the same? No. Come back at another level. You turn me down the first time, all right, I'm just going to get better. I'll be back. It might take me six months to get better, but I'll be back. It might take me a year. I might need to go to university. I might need to take some courses. I, may to, I might need to look at a YouTube tutorial. I don't know, but I'm coming back better. I said, I'm coming back better. Excuse me? Yeah, I just applied last six months, but I'm here to apply again. Well, what's different from the last time you came? I'm at a whole nother level. No, nope, we don't have no room. Okay, praise God. Then that just means I'm going to get better. I'm going to back to get better again. I'll be back. <laughs> like Arnold Schwarzenegger said, I'll be back. <laughs> so, you, <laughs> so you're going to get better. Watch a tutorial. Take a class. Talk to somebody who's at where you want to go. Get somebody who could take you to that level. I remember when I wanted to learn Afrikaans. I said, Uncle Pat, I need to get better. He says, okay, move in with me for a year. So I moved in. Come on, somebody. And he taught me the Afrikaans, the savor Afrikaans. Diabaris is ifamora gereed om te gee. Huh? Huh? Moved in for a whole year. Because I'm trying to get better. Who am I talking to today? Maybe the first time you got denied. The second time you got denied. Go somewhere and get better. When you come back the next time, they say, yeah, it's me again. I'm back for the job. But this time I'm at a whole nother level. And they say, what? You back again? Any door that God opens, no man can close. Hey, I want you to clap like you're getting better. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me tell you one more story, then I'll be done. You went for your driver's license. Oh, this is going to hit a lot of people right here. And you failed the first time. Driving. You didn't even get out the lot. Fail. I'm coming back. Let me go get better. Take some more lessons. Take some more lessons. Come back. Road. Fail. You know a roll is a media fail. You know how I know? Because I did it. <laughs> Went back. This is me. For those of you that don't know, I have my South Africa's driver's license. I'm going to provoke you right now. <laughs> yes, I have my South Africa's driver's license. If you don't have one, okay, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Let me behave. First time I went, fail. But you know what I said? I'm coming back better. Went and took some more lessons with the L on the car. Come on, somebody. Right? People hooting at you. Right? Because you got to do all the observing. One, two, this, that. Blah. You got 0.8 seconds to take off when the light turns green. <laughs> right? But you got to do one, two, three, four, by that. Blah, 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 blah. People driving by you. Right? But I was getting better. I'm trying to encourage someone today. So then I went back the second time. Yeah, I'm here again. That's right. Yeah, it's me. Put it in. Car road. Yeah, you know, okay, you're done. I thought he was joking. He's writing. It's funny. He goes, you're done. I go, no way. I just rode a little bit. Immediate fell. But you know what? I'm getting better. Went back and took some more lessons. Faithful L. Doesn't stand for losers. Stands for levels. <laughs> hey! So I went back the third time. I got out the lot this time. Come on, somebody. I drove around in Goodwood this time. Uh, when I went back to the Goodwood place, they said, guess what? You have passed the turn. You have passed. Who am I talking to today? You might not have made it the first time. You might not have made it the second time. But I want to encourage you, don't get comfortable outside of Canaan.